open up your Bibles with me now to the book of First Kings. First Kings this evening. It's right after Second Samuel. If you've been with us, you just turn the page. And Father, this evening, we thank you for your word. Lord, it's life-changing. It's everything, Lord. Father, continue to allow your word to accomplish the purposes that you have set forth, Lord, that it would not return void. Thank you, Lord, uh, that in this place, the word of God is held up in its proper place, Lord. And we pray that you would use it even tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. There have been occasions when people have asked me, why study the Old Testament? I mean, it's old. And you assume, shouldn't we be studying the New Testament because, well, it's new. And I understand why they ask that question. But folks, the Old Testament is as much inspired and inerrant as the New Testament. For one thing, the Old Testament lays the foundation for the teachings and events that are found in the New Testament. The Bible is a progressive revelation that ultimately points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus said himself in John chapter 5 in verse 39, Jesus declared, you search the scriptures for in them you think that you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. What scriptures was Jesus talking about? Uh, not the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. He's talking about the Old Testament. In, us, in other words, he's saying, I'm throughout the entire Old Testament. It all points to a person, to Christ. In John chapter four, verse 46, when Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, he declared, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. When did Moses write? The Old Testament. The Old Testament records numerous detailed prophecies that could only have come true if the Bible is God's word. Also, we should study the Old Testament for the numerous lessons that it contains for us. By observing the lives of the characters of the Old Testament, you find guidance for your own life. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 11, he said this, now all of these things were written. He's talking about the Old Testament. All these things were written as examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And then in writing to the Romans in chapter 15 and verse 4, Paul declared, for whatever things were written before, they were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Oh, it's important to study the Old Testament. First Kings was written to record history, but more important to teach lessons of history. As with the other historical books in the Old Testament, the history recorded here was meant to preserve not just important events, but spiritual truths learned through those events. And in our Bibles, the books of First and 2 Kings are two separate books. However, originally, they were put together as one book describing a unified story. The book of 1 Kings covers a 400-year period of Israel's history starting from the end of David's reign. Now, there are some differing opinions as to the authorship of the book of first Kings. Some have proposed the idea that maybe it was a priest. Others say that it could have been a royal historic writer, but traditionally it is believed that it was Jeremiah, the prophet who was the author. The book of first Kings starts out with the sun setting on David and rising on his successor, whose name was Solomon. 
Solomon's ascent to the throne, however, was not without a struggle, without opposition, and without intrigue. We begin now in verse 1 as we see the decline of King David. Now, King David was old and advanced in years, and they put covers on him, but he couldn't get warm. Therefore, his servant said to him, let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord the king and let her stand before the king and let her care for him and let her lie in your bosom that our Lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and they brought her to the king. And the young woman was very lovely. And she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. David is now nearing the end of his days. He is both old and cold, with apparent circulatory problems. David isn't able to stay warm regardless of how many blankets were placed on him. So a young woman, a Shunammite woman named Abishag, served as a nurse to the king. She would lay next to the king in order to have that body heat to keep him warm, but she did not have a physical relationship with him. That is why it says he did not know her. She just simply was there to keep him warm. It's difficult to see David this way, especially when we've seen him in other capacities. He's no longer the giant killer. He's no longer the lion and bear slayer. He'd once been. Seasons of battle and hardship have taken their toll upon the shepherd king. He had become frail and dependent on others. And one thing that just from the jump stands out rather quickly is that ultimately we also are deteriorating. It may come as a surprise. Maybe for others of us, not so much. But eventually, your health fades. We fight it the older we get. But at some point, we are humbled and we realize those days of our youth are gone. Oh, in our minds, we feel as strong as the day we started. But then we realize it's just not the case. You can't run as fast. You can't run as far. The moment you try, something pulls, something strains. <laughs> Things become sore rather easily, and we don't recover as quickly. I mean, there's stuff now like you just bend over to put your shoe on. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> something went out, and I can't get up. I mean, that's, that's difficult to deal with, truthfully. And your eyes go, and you fight it. Now, I can see, totally can see, <laughs> nothing. But I, I, you try. Your hearing goes, I'm sorry, did you say something? Your back aches, your knees are shot, your hip, you start getting replacement parts. <laughs> hip replaced, knee replaced, this replaced, shoulder replaced. I talk to some of the guys here, I know, you know who you are, and I say, hey, what, this is the future? Like, I, Jesus, come before I get replacements. Just take the whole thing, you know. <laughs> The point I'm making is this. The psalmist declared, Lord, Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. James said in James chapter four, he said, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow for what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. In those seasons, it's important to remember something. It's important to remember who we are in Christ. Our identity is not bound up in what we do, but who we are, and more importantly, whose we are. I read a quote today that encouraged my heart, and it said, quote, you aren't your gifts. Don't let your abilities lead you to pride, and don't let your inabilities lead you to despair. You aren't your accomplishments. I mean, the greatest blessing is just knowing Jesus. You remember Jesus said to his disciples when they returned from doing all these great works and casting out demons, Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but here's something to rejoice in. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's something to get excited about. So I'll never sprint again. That's all right. My name is written in heaven. 
So I'll never, let's just stop there. You understand my name is written in heaven and in that I praise God. Amidst David's faltering health, there were questions that needed to be answered. Who would be the heir apparent? Who would take David's place now to lead the nation? The Lord seemed to declare that it would be Solomon. However, not everyone agreed with that. David's physical weakness tempted potential candidates to maneuver for power. And the two that were in contention were Solomon, David's son, and the other guy, Adonijah, who was also David's son from another woman. Now notice verse 5. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen, 50 men to run before him. And his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? Uh, he was also very good looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom. Then he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed and they helped Adonijah. But Zadok, the priest, Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Reah, and the mighty men who belonged to David, they were not with Adonijah. And verse 9, Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen, fattened cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is by Enrogel. And he also invited all of his brothers, the king's son, all the men of Judah, and the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benani, the mighty men, or Solomon, his brother. Because David, at this point, had not yet come out publicly declaring that Solomon was his successor, Adonijah forced the issue. And the steps that he took declaring himself to be king, you know, they were very similar to his brother, whose name was Absalom. You remember him, long-haired guy, got his hair caught, you know, rode into battle on a donkey, got stuck in a tree and died with his spears. You remember him? That was his brother. He was good looking. His little bro was good looking too, apparently. Came from the same uh, DNA. But it says here, notice this, he promoted himself. He said, I will be king. The Bible says promotion comes from the Lord. He who exalts himself will be humbled. This guy exalted himself. That ought to tell you something. Secondly, it says that he, it, it infers that he prepared for himself a royal entourage of horses and chariots and men. That's exactly what Absalom did. He got a whole crew together to run before him to make himself look like a king. I am king and notice I have people around me who also feel that I should be king. He was also very confident in himself. And, he, and if that weren't enough, he made some alliances that were significant. He aligned himself with Joab, who was the nephew of David, who had been elevated to be David's general. But on a number of occasions, as we have cited in Samuel, Joab had sinned. He had been removed and then fought his way back and killed this person and got to that person. David didn't want uh, Joab to be leading his armies anymore. David actually tried to remove him. But here is David, now weak. Joab sides with Adonijah, sees another opportunity to continue on in the next political go-round. Abiathar, who was also removed, he sides with Adonijah. These are the men that Adonijah took counsel from and aligns himself with, and they were all really adversaries of David. But then he threw a party, a celebration of his coronation, self-proclaimed. He didn't invite Nathan. He didn't invite Zadok the priest. He didn't invite Benaniah, the mighty men, Solomon, or David. Obviously, you don't invite those guys. He exalts himself instead of humbling himself. He goes against God's will and God's word. He sought the wrong counsel, aligned himself with the wrong people. Why not invite Nathan to your party? Because he'll tell you the truth that you're out of line. Well, why, why don't you take counsel from spiritual leader like Zadok? Because he also will tell you what you don't want to hear. Isn't it interesting how sometimes when people want to go against the will of God, they surround themselves with other people who will really fortify their decision to go against the will of God. They just find people like that. They find each other. Misery loves company and they get around each other. And they say, yo, you should do that. Uh, don't worry about what they say over there. They don't know what they're talking about. Actually, they're saying the Bible. That, don't worry about that. And you just, you find people to somehow comfort you in your disobedience. Big mistake. And that's what was happening here. 
Also, we find here that David made a mistake. He didn't rebuke his son. This is something, David lost control of his family. And this started way back. You remember, uh, there were times when, when David, you know, Amnon, he didn't do anything about it. Absalom didn't do anything about it. Adonijah, now he can barely get out of bed and he's saying, just deal with it. You know, he's not, he's not holding them accountable. And so as a result, they're doing whatever they want. And during this self-promotion ceremony, however, David receives an important visit that would lead to a decisive decision there on his deathbed. Notice in verse 11, so Nathan, that is the prophet Nathan, who'd been with David for some time, he spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and David, our Lord, does not know it? Come, please, let me now give you advice that you may save your life and the life of your son, Solomon. Listen, Nathan knew what was about to happen. If Adonijah forcefully took the throne, then Solomon and Bathsheba would be the first to be put to death. And so he begins to counsel or give her advice. This is what you need to do. You need to listen to me. It's good to have good counselors around you. And he tells her, verse 13, go immediately to King David and say to him, did not my Lord, O King, swear to your maidservant saying, assuredly your son Solomon shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne. Apparently David, the king, had made a promise to Bathsheba and she's coming to claim that promise that he had made. Keep that in mind. Why then has Adonijah become king? Verse 14, then while you're still speaking there with the king, I will also come in after you and I will confirm your words. So this is the plan. Nathan says, you got to go in now. Time is of the essence. Do not wait. You need to go petition the king. And once you get started, I will come in and confirm everything that you've said. So, verse 15, Bathsheba went into the chamber of the king, and the king was very old, and Abishag, the Shunammite, was serving the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did homage to the king, and the king said, what is your wish? Then she said to him, my lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your maidservant, saying, assuredly Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now look. Adonijah has become king, and now, my lord, the king, you do not know about it. He sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance. He's invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest, Joab, the commander of the army, but Solomon, your servant, he hasn't invited. And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. Otherwise, it will happen. When my lord, the king, rests with his fathers, that is, when he dies, that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders, which means, in essence, we are as good as dead if you don't do something now, David. As she goes in before the king, she pleads with him. I think in any situation, folks, let me just make a practical application here. I think it is important in any situation, you know where you want to run? You know where you want to go? You want to go to the king. I bring my needs to the king. And what do I do when I come to the king? You know what I do? I remind him of what he said. What does Bathsheba do? She reminds the king of the promise that he made. King, you said this. And when I am in need, I go to the Lord and I, I Lord, um, real quick, um, you said this and I believe that. And I'm asking you to fulfill your promise. I don't mind praying the promises of God. I think it's a good idea. It's good for me. It's also good. Not that God needs to be reminded like, oh, did I say that? What chapter? Not, he knows exactly what he said. It's not so much for him to remember. It's for me to remind myself of the promises of God. And there I find strength and comfort because I know God will fulfill his word. He is faithful. If he said it, <laughs> right? I believe it. That... Settles it, exactly. It's what I was gonna say. That's exactly right. Plead the promises of God. Lord, you said that you would provide a peace that surpasses understanding if I would present these things to you. I'm looking for that. I need that peace. It's there. Lord, you said that you would provide for all my needs. Lord, I got some needs. I know you know about them, but here they are. You said that you were Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. Be that. Be who you say you are. Lord, be that for me. And you know what he is? He fulfills his word. He keeps his promises. We have been given, the Bible says, great and exceedingly, exceedingly great and precious promises have been given unto us. 
All the promises of God are in him. Yes. And amen. <laughs> so take him at his word, bring it before him, present it to the king. That's what Bathsheba did. I also love the fact that she went to him in private in a secluded place. Jesus said, hey, listen, when you pray, go into the secret place and when you've shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Go into that place with just you and the Lord. She also humbled herself. Says she bowed down, paid homage. It's this posture of humility. It's the same way we come before our greater than David. And she also submits to the king because she calls him Lord. Lord, I present my needs to you. I take you at your word. This is what you said. I am humble and also I'm submitted. Your will be done. But I'm letting you know what's going on. She informs the king of what she needs. And of course, right after that, who shows up? Nathan, just as he said, verse 22. And just then, while she was still talking with the king, Nathan, the prophet, also came in. So they told the king saying, Here's Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, my Lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? For he's gone down today and he sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's sons and the commander of the army and Abiathar the priest. And look, they're eating and drinking before him. And they say, long live King Adonijah. Bathsheba just didn't go on herself by herself to intercede before the king. There was somebody else who prayed with her as it were. Can you see this? Also came before the king pleading the same thing. It's good to have people around you to pray with you. To go before the king together, to present these things to the Lord, to petition heaven. Can I just pause for a moment and say this? There is a reason why we circle up at the end of every Wednesday night service to pray together. First of all, it's a command to pray. Jesus said men ought always to pray. The Bible exhorts us to pray. Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. So it's important to pray. But here's something that happens in these circles. Maybe you're one of those people that does not feel comfortable praying out loud. Let me tell you something. Then don't. Be still. Be quiet. Until you have peace to pray out loud. I also encourage you to take a step of faith and actually pray out loud. Well, I don't know what I'm going to say. Don't worry about it. Nobody in the prayer circle is judging you. It's not like, that was pretty good. <laughs> I've heard better. Uh, nobody's thinking that. We're all petitioning the Lord together. But if you don't feel like you can pray out loud, then listen to the people pray and learn how to pray from your brothers and sisters. And not only that, but those of you who operate in the giftings of the spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge and discernment, etc. Hey, use those gifts in those circles. And I just want to tell you, I have heard responses and testimonies of that very thing happening. Someone says, it's funny, I was in a prayer circle the other night on Wednesday night and, and somebody was there. They don't even know me or what I'm going through and they just started praying and guess what? They prayed exactly what I needed to hear and what I had been thinking about. How does that happen? Do we, do we tell people, okay, listen, is, what, what section are you in? Let's work this out, all right, okay. Back corner, yeah, okay, this is what they need prayer for, hit it. No, the Holy Spirit is informing his people and using the body of Christ giving them insight and we're praying for one another. Folks, listen, this is what makes us strong. There is something unique and special about Wednesday night that other people, I wish they knew it, but you know it and it has to do with prayer and seeking the face of God. So that's why we do it together. Amen? So here he is petitioning the king, verse 26, and he says, but listen, king, I, he didn't invite me. I didn't get an invitation. <laughs> Your servant. Nor did Zadok the priest, nor Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, nor your servant Solomon. And then he says, has this thing been done by my lord the king and you've not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So now David hears it from Bathsheba, but now he hears it from his trusted prophet, advisor, longtime friend and mentor, Nathan, and he realizes he's got to do something. You, you have to make a decision. You, you know what's happening here is there is a transition 
from one to the next. This is really important. Um, in churches, this is important. How you transition, who steps in for you after you leave, that there's a good handoff. In business, it's a similar thing. In families, it's really important how you do this. And David, you can't just be quiet about this. You need to go on record. You need to say it so there's no confusion. Make it clear. And that's what he does. So verse 28, then King David answered, and he said, call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath and he said, as the Lord lives, notice this, as the Lord lives who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel saying, surely Solomon your son shall be king after me and he shall sit on my throne in my place, so I certainly will do this day. It's about to happen. This is, it's going to come to pass. I, I, God has delivered me from every distress in my life. And I'm so thankful that he does that even for us tonight. And Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth. She paid homage to the king and said, let my Lord King David live forever. And so David now begins to set the succession plan in motion as Solomon will be seated upon his throne, but there were several things that David does. He gives specific instructions as to what they were to do in order that everyone would know Solomon was the king. Notice the instructions. And King David, verse 32, said, call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, that's the one who's over the mighty men, and they came before the king. The king also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord. Have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. That is to the springs there of Gihon. There let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over all Israel and blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be king in my place for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. These are the instructions. This is how we're gonna do it. This is the coronation day for Solomon to be the next king. Very specific. Get my donkey, personal donkey. Put him on it. Take him down to Gihon, to the springs, blow the horn, long live King Solomon, march him back up to my throne, sit him down, he's the king today. I'm so glad that David said this while he was alive. It was very clear what his wishes were, what his desire was. He made it obvious. In verse 36, Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, answered the king and said, Amen. May the Lord God of my Lord the king say so too. As the Lord has been with my Lord the King, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. Wow, that's saying something. He's in agreement with what David's decided and he's even asking God to do greater things than had already been done. In verse 38, so David's servants did as they were instructed. I like that. The servants did what the king told them to do. It's important for us. We are the servants of the Lord. When the king gives instructions, we need to follow them. Do what he says. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, included the Cherethites and the Pelethites. They went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and took him to Gihon. Then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and he anointed Solomon. Again, what was the purpose of this oil? The purpose of this oil was just, it basically was anointing him to be king. It is symbolic. It is a type. It is a picture, by the way, of the work of the Holy Spirit throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament. That oil that would come upon him, just like it came upon David when he was anointed and others who were anointed. The anointing of the Spirit, a picture of it in the Old Testament for the job, for the task that was set before Solomon. And so they blew the horn. And all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him. And the people played the flutes. They rejoiced with great joy so that the earth seemed to split with their sound. I mean, the result, this is so beautiful to me. I love this part because when the people did what the king asked, 
you find that the result is that there was worship. I mean, they're playing flutes, they're playing music, and there's joy. There's joy walking in obedience to the instructions of the king. People say, well, I just don't have any joy. I'm not very happy. I'm always anxious. I don't like this and I don't like that. And, I'm, and I, sometimes I wonder, like, and I'm not saying, again, we've talked about this before, that you don't have to be fake or try to pretend. But, but my question is, how are you, how, what, what, what's your relationship like with Jesus? Do you spend time with Jesus? I don't spend time with Jesus. That's going to have an impact on your joy. Do you spend time in the word? I don't really. That, that's going to have, that's, that'll have an impact on, on your on your you know, your thinking, anxiety, whatever. It, it really impacts it. Are you living in sin apart from God? Well, that's uh, your opinion. Well, that's also gonna have an impact on your joy and your anxiety. It's, like, it's, just, it's all related. But here when they're following the instructions of the king, there is just rejoicing and, and it's so exciting. It's like the earth is gonna split. There's just this, this movement, if you would, among the people as the news of the new king has reached the ears of many. Well, verse 41, now Adonijah. Meanwhile, shift, like back, like this one scene, ah, rejoicing. Boop, we go back to Ad Adonijah's party, all right? He's with all his boys. They're hanging out, you know, eat barbecue, fatty calf and oxen and just, man, such a great time over there at this party. Party is about to stop. So Adonijah and all the guests who are with him heard it as they finished eating. So they just got done. And Joab heard the sound of the horn. Oh, he's heard that before. And he said, why is the city in such a noisy uproar? While he was still speaking, there came Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest. And Adonijah said to him, come in, for you are a prominent man, and bring good news. <laughs> That's what you think. Look at what it says, verse 43. I mean, that, so you know what that tells me? Let me just say what that tells me. That tells me these guys were delusional. Like you... You're doing exactly what you're not supposed to be doing. You think, of course we're going to get good news. No, no, there's no good news for you, man. This is not the news you want. You think it's good news. Oh, of course. Verse 43. Then Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, no. Well, that's interesting. Come in for your prominent man and bring good news. No. <laughs> Our Lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has sent him with Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites, the Pelethites. They made him, listen, they made him ride on the king's mule. All right? You know what that means. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, they've anointed him at Gihon. They've gone up from there rejoicing. The city's in an uproar. This is the noise that you've heard. You want to know what's going on out there? Solomon's king. That's what's going on. And that means you're not, Adonijah. Thanks for the party. Bye. I mean, they're out. They're leaving. <laughs> verse 47. Verse 46. Also, if that weren't enough, he didn't only ride on the donkey. That's one thing. But now he sits on the throne of the kingdom. And moreover, oh, there's more. Moreover, the king's servants have gone to bless our King David, saying, this is what everybody's saying, may God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne. And even the king bowed down himself on the bed. Also the king said thus, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has given one to sit on my throne this day while my eyes see it. You know what I love about this? Here these guys were fighting against the will of God. They had an army together. They had an entourage. They had a party. They had a group gathered. They were, it was so great. Everything's so awesome. Look what we're doing. And the Lord said, nope. He actually said, no, no. That's not how it's going to happen. I mean, God just did something completely different, completely different than what they expected. They, they fought against the will of God. God. God always has the last word. He always does. He said, no. Verse 49 this is right, right at the end of we get this good news. So all the guests who were with Adonijah were afraid and they arose and each one went his way. Well, that's the end of the party. I mean, that's it. No leftovers and we're not going to take any of this home. Everybody just leaves Adonijah. Suddenly his plan came to nothing. He's there by himself. All of his friends who are with him left. They're fearful. King David had foiled and really the Lord had foiled the succession plans of Adonijah. 
And you know, as I read this story again, it made me think a couple of thoughts. And one is, a person can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from the Lord. I mean, Adonijah was striving. He was in the flesh. From the outside, everything looked legitimate. It looked healthy. It looked, oh, this looks good. I mean, he looks like a king. He looks a lot like Absalom when you think about it. It's a good looking kid. He should be, and look at the group he's got with him. Look at these people that are running with him. These are beautiful people. This must be something. But everybody got on the bandwagon temporarily. But these people weren't necessarily solid. It was the flesh. You can get a crowd together. That's not hard. But the second thing I noted is that the king, as I said it earlier, always has the final word. The, the king of kings is in control. People can politically do this. They can push for that. They can try to do this. But we listen, we know what happens at the end when all the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and he will rule and reign. There is one kingdom that lasts forever. It's not America, and it's not the Middle East, and it's not China, and it's not anywhere else you could think of. It's the kingdom of God, period. That is it. Keep that in your mind this year, church. Just remember that. Are you saying, no, I'm just saying remember that. God is in control. Don't say I'm saying you should. Are you saying you shouldn't vote? You shouldn't serve? I hate it when people do that. No, I'm saying there's one kingdom that's going to last. It's God's kingdom, regardless of what happens this year. He's still the Lord. God's promises are going to stand. What a blessing to know that, that God is in control. Everything outside, that which is tangible and visible, that runs contrary to what God has promised and contrary to what our king has said, it's still going to come to pass. Well, verse 50, almost through here. Now, Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. So he arose and he went and he took hold of the horns of the altar. Now that is interesting. The horns of the altar. If you saw the brazen altar, it, you know, the way it's described, it has horns on the outside of it. And grabbing hold of the horns was like a place of safety. You're at the altar. Like, can't kill me because I'm, I'm holding on to this. So almost, I mean, Adonijah knew he was in trouble. So he is, he's running for the altar to hold of the horns. But here's the interesting thing. He went to the altar, but we're going to find out his heart hadn't changed. You know, there's people in times of trouble, they run to the altar, man. They are running to the, I'm going to the, I'm going to the altar. But the problem is they run to the altar, but they don't run to Jesus. I mean, that, that, there's, a, there's a change of heart that needs to happen. You can go through motions. That's what Adonijah is going to do, but his heart hadn't changed. Well, so it says here, he's taken hold of the horns of the altar saying, let King Solomon swear to me that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. In verse 52, Solomon said, well, if he proves himself a worthy man, not one hair of him shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. There you have it. So King Solomon sent them to bring him down from the altar. And he came down and he fell before King Solomon. And Solomon said, go to your house. I mean, that's grace right there. I mean, this guy had tried to undermine, usurp the authority, go against the will of God, tried to potentially, and, but you know what? It didn't happen. And Solomon says, just go to your house, man. Just go to your house. And he did. Finally, chapter two, verse one. Now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore. Prove yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your son take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you know. And let's pause there. Because there's other things that David will say. These, these are David's final words to his son Solomon. And, and it reminds me a lot of the last words you remember of Joshua. Similar. The final words of Joshua. The final words of David. 
I think of the final words of Jacob there in Genesis 49 as he went down and blessed all of his sons, prophesied over them. But David said, Solomon, you're going to need to be strong. You're going to need to be a man. I mean, David's not going to, he's not going to be there. And he, and he tells, if you notice this, he tells Solomon what would be the key to his success and what would allow him to be a good king. And, and, and I think it's some of the things that David did not do, but he goes back to it. He tells him, you, you need to stick to the word of God, the commandments, the judgments, everything God said in his word, what's written in the law of Moses. And then he says, if you keep these things, if you adhere to these things, if you follow these things, Solomon, listen, you're gonna prosper in what you do. God's gonna have his hand on you. He's gonna bless you. If you turn from this, if you turn from God's statutes, if you go your own way, if you wanna do your own thing, you wanna go, listen, it's not gonna go well for you. This is what God's saying. God's gonna keep his word. Just stick to it. I mean, such important instruction and even for us tonight, taking heed to the word of God, living, living according to the word of God, following the statutes, staying in his word. Guys, that, that's what keeps us close. That's what helps us navigate through the crazy of this world, just staying in the word, staying close to Jesus. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And he leads them in, he leads them out, he protects, he guides. So, so the exhortation tonight, as we conclude, is, hey, Keep charge of the Lord God. Walk in his ways. Keep his word. Keep his statutes. Walk in, keep his judgments, his testimonies as it is, as it is written in the word of God. And, and God will continue to bless, continue to guide, continue to provide, continue to open doors, close doors. And um, it's good exhortation for us from the king, but our greater than David, our king, Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's stand together.